This time on Monkey Thieves. Bippin and the Splinter group scrape the bottom of the barrel, but finally start to find their feet on the street. The monkey catcher goes undercover and gets too close for comfort. And as hunger hits home, Rani and Kamal risk everything by leaving their temple sanctuary exposed. It's another fruitless morning at Jaipur's Gauta Temple. The global recession means handouts from Hindus are dwindling drastically. The lack of food has recently torn one rhesus macaque troop in two. Now, with only half the gang left at the temple, there is still not enough food to go round. The monkeys can't stomach another morning without breakfast. Rani and her partner in power, Kamal, sense rumblings in the ranks, and not just from their empty tummies. They take a big risk and lead their troop into town in search of food. The last members of the Galta Gang elite slip out of the gates and leave their precious temple home unprotected. In the city, Bipin and his troop head towards the temple. Since the Galta Gang split in two, the Splinter Group have been living on the street. Their former home is out of sight, but not out of mind. A few tough days on the street have convinced them that life by the temple's prize pools is worth fighting for. But it's a battle that can wait till after breakfast. A baker makes his rounds, and Bippin spots an opportunity. Most customers pay for their daily bread, but Bippin is short of dough. He's short of scruples too, and soon comes up with another way to snack a snack. The baker tots up his morning's takings, and Bippin takes his chance. With the monkey thief's help, profit quickly turns hey, hey, into loss. Hey, hey, hey. But it'll take more than a pilfered pastry to keep this army on the move. Bippin tastes adventure, and the splinter troop move on to look for other traders who might benefit from their custom. As monkey thieves around the city focus on filling their stomachs, someone else concentrates on filling his cages. The more people tighten their belts during the economic slump, the more monkeys are forced to steal in order to survive. The monkey catcher's services have never been in such high demand. Dana Lal is a well-known face in macaque circles. It's a face they've learned to fear. For the city's monkey catcher, celebrity status is causing problems at work. 
The hairy hoodlums clock his menacing moustache as soon as he arrives at a crime scene. And immediately bolt for safety. But it'll take more than a slippery macaque to make Dana Lal throw in the towel. So far, he's been keeping his solution under wraps. Now it's time to go undercover. Rani, Kamal, and the rest of the Galta gang elite safely reach the heart of the city. They keep a close eye out for any of their ousted former troop members. But there are no familiar faces here. And there is still no sign of anything to eat. Kamal's leadership begins to look a little shaky. He's already seen the troops spit in two on his watch. If he doesn't shape up soon, the gang could start to question his position of power. Some macaques just aren't leadership material. And Kamal is being stretched to his limits. India's Pink City can be a dangerous place, and not just for macaques. Animal rescuer Suresh Valmiki brings another brave little patient back to the Help in Suffering clinic. This young langur monkey has been caught in rusty barbed wire. In his struggle to break free, he stripped his tail to the bone and must be in agony. Unable to untangle himself, he's been abandoned by his troop and left to die alone. Suresh is extremely worried. A langur's tail is longer than its body and acts as a stabilizer for their trademark flying leaps. Even if the vets can save this little langur's life, it is likely they'll have to amputate his tail. And for a langur, losing a tail is as traumatic as losing a leg. On the other side of town, Bipin and the Splinter Troop begin to realize that street life might be a good thing. They start to stalk another street seller. But Tito Twig's a more appetizing option. A tourist tucks into his lunch at a local restaurant. The monkeys move in for a closer inspection. Taking food from right under his nose is too pushy even for this troop of troublemakers. But like all good macaques, this gang know that the best tidbits are often found hidden away. No one is watching the back door. In the bins at the back of the restaurant, the sneaky troop find an all-you-can-eat buffet. Chories and chips might seem like junk food, but one man's junk is another monkey's treasure. But as long as they eat their fruit and veg too, it's all part of a balanced diet.
The diner out front is unaware of the chaos unfolding behind the scenes. But the scavengers inside haven't forgotten the sight of his piled up plate, so they sneak another peek. The tourist picks the wrong moment to turn his back, and his meal is soon spiced up with a sprinkle of saucy monkeys. Bippin and the gang make a quick getaway. In another corner of the city, Rani and her gang also seem to have bagged breakfast at last. A human handing out nuts seems just like old times. But while most people are feeling the financial pinch, this offering could come at a price. Rani's youngest offspring, TJ and Isha, seem happy to take food from this strangely dressed philanthropist. Fashion isn't important if food is forthcoming. Even the boss Kamal lets his guard down and is soon eating out of the mysterious stranger's hand. Only Queen Rani hangs back. She's been around the block a few times and knows better than to trust a masked man. Like humans, macaques focus on the eyes in order to recognize a face. But macaques are better at picking out differences in other monkey faces than seeing the subtle distinctions between human features. And with most of it covered, Rani finds this face even harder to place. The hooded stranger hopes that by sneaking up to the monkeys incognito, he can lull them into a false sense of security. If he can convince the troop he's a friend, Dana could get his cages close enough to catch them. Rani suddenly realizes where she's seen those eyes before. A shrill bark is all it takes to alert the rest of the gang. TJ and Isha are out of sight the second the alarm sounds. The eccentric Benita is the last to cotton on but she grasps the threat just in time. <laughs> Biting the hand that feeds can be a good idea. The monkey catcher hasn't pulled the wool over their eyes this time. But it's enough to convince the Gulta gang elite that hitting the streets was a bad move. It seems sitting it out at the temple is a much safer option. They turn tail and head for home. Dana Lal will have to come up with another plan. A bite from a monkey can be a potentially dangerous thing. While Suresh tends to the young Langa in the Help in Suffering clinic, two of his colleagues carefully collect an adult macaque in urgent need of help. He is partially paralyzed and can barely lift his head. Jagdish is an experienced animal handler and knows that monkeys can carry rabies. Seizures like this can be a symptom. He's careful to keep clear of the macaque's large teeth.
back at the clinic, the vets have a different diagnosis. The poor animal couldn't bite anyone, even if he wanted to. His jaw is locked shut, so that even eating is impossible. These severe muscle spasms are a classic sign of tetanus, a potentially fatal infectious disease that attacks the nervous system. The monkey's symptoms are very advanced. The vets treat him with muscle relaxant drugs and antibiotics. But it could be too late. <laughs> Following their raid on a restaurant, Bippin and the Splinter Troop seem to be seeing the Pink City through rose-tinted spectacles. Their stomachs haven't been this full for a while. And there's nothing like the contentment of a bulging belly to convince a macaque that all is well with the world. A few hours ago, the troop were heading towards their former home, ready to storm the temple and confront Rani and the others. But a couple of successful raids have shown them that street life is worth sticking with. Newly dominant Devdan and Jaya are certainly happy with the new status quo. Following the family divide, they found themselves at the top of the tree. Their baby, Dimple, is quickly getting into the swing of a new role as princess. For these exiles, confronting Rani's troop and reclaiming their patch at the temple is no longer top of their agenda. The Splinter Group are not alone in getting the upper hand in adverse circumstances. 60 miles beyond the city limits, their old enemy, Zamir, makes the most of his new life in the country. Following his deportation at the hands of the monkey catcher, it seemed as though Zamir was destined for a life of skulking through the scrub, with roadside begging the only way to get food. But Mr. Devious finds a way to milk the situation. The wily male has seen this pallid juice before when he's stolen from babies in the city. But it seems it doesn't start life in bottles. Millions of families across India depend on rich buffalo milk. And plenty of provincial macaques have learned that milking time is a good time to be around the cowshed. Zamir just needs to watch and learn. The troop keep their eyes on the churn. But the farm girl's attention is soon elsewhere. For the white stuff to come out, greens need to go in. So chopping fodder to keep up with the buffalo's appetite is a daily duty. The monkeys pick their moment to pop into the milk bar. Zamir's not easily cowed, but he thinks twice before stealing from such an enormous target. A well-aimed kick from a big bovine could cause some serious damage to a much smaller macaque. But the rest of the gang aren't phased at all. They've done this before. And sure enough, the chilled out chewer doesn't seem to mind whether it's humans or monkeys that make a meal of her milk. 
Macaques eat just about anything that comes their way. But they usually get protein and calcium from nuts, seeds and insects. Dropping in on the dairy gives this troop a welcome change to the menu and a much needed nutritional boost. Zamir joins the others for a drink and laps up his new criminal knowledge. The ex-urbanite is now a committed convert to the countryside and his old life in the city seems very far away. Back in Jaipur, a double tragedy has hit help in suffering. Suresh's little langur with a broken tail, and the poor macaque paralyzed by tetanus, have both died. It's never good to lose a patient. But as a Hindu, Suresh believes that death is temporary. The monkeys' lives may have ended, but their souls have begun a great journey. And they will soon be reincarnated to a new life, perhaps even as humans. Usually, it's Suresh that provides love and comfort for these little orphans. But today, they seem to be repaying the favor. After their run-in with the monkey catcher, Rani and the Gulta gang elite hot-foot it back to the sanctuary of the temple. But as they approach the gates, something is terribly wrong. Everywhere they look, there's a langor. Rani's made a big mistake leaving her temple home unguarded. Their gangly woodland neighbors have seized their chance to claim her territory. With half the Gulta gang gone, the Langors now easily outnumber the macaques. Rani looks to Kamal. Now is the time for her alpha male to prove himself as a worthy king and at least try to reclaim part of their temple territory. Even with the odds against them, the old alpha male, Tarak, would never have stood for a Langor uprising. But Kamal is no Tarak. Far from standing firm on the front line, the nervy new leader is first to flee. The gang have no choice but to retreat. Rani's beloved temple is lost. Now the exiled Splinter Troop aren't the only gang forced to sleep on the streets. The Gulta gang elite are homeless. Next time on Monkey Thieves, the temple's new tenants show no sign of shifting. Bipin and the Splinter Troop strike gold with a fruitful market raid. And Rani and Kamal get caught in the crossfire when gang warfare erupts in the city.